Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my clock's showing that it's 12 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Kevin Minton, and uh, I'm the owner and CEO of Chief Executive Boards. Um, I want to thank you for taking time to join us uh, for today's webinar, uh, Sales Mastery. And, uh, it, you know, if you're tired of the roller coaster uh, revenue months and you kind of find it a hassle to manage your pipeline, uh, or you'd like to uh, hold your sales team accountable, uh, then, you know, hopefully this webinar will offer some tips on uh, to help you to formulize a plan to move the sales efforts from the C-suite into the hands of the people that are really dedicated to bringing in new business. Bear with me just a moment. I'm having a, a difficult time advancing the slide. We're just going to uh, close it out and open it back up here, folks. Just bear with us just a moment. Uh, there we go. All right. And uh, we're headquartered in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, with executive peer advisory boards in multiple cities throughout the United States. And I'll be your host today. Um, I'd like to invite you to stay tuned for future webinars on our website located at the bottom of this slide, uh, www.chiefexecutiveboards.com. Before we dive straight into our main topic, uh, you might be a little curious to learn more about CEBI. Uh, so I thought I'd just take a few minutes to explain who we are. We are a uh, boutique executive peer advisory service with local and national boards located throughout the eastern and the uh, Midwest states. The purpose of CEBI is to help CEOs, presidents, business owners um, to share ideas and experience to avoid pitfalls and potholes that many have already experienced. In other words, we, we help steer you from reinventing the wheel within your own business. Members convene in face-to-face -face forums and really they receive unvarnished advice in a safe, confidential environment that's typically uh, unavailable elsewhere. It's kind of like having your own personal think tank. As an example, uh, we address what keeps you up at night, items you don't have an opportunity to discuss with anyone else. Members can avail of uh, local and national advisory board forums, uh, attend educational summits, have access to CEBI members, our libraries, workshops, and other webinars such as this one that we're presenting today. A couple of housekeeping items before we move forward. Um, go ahead and post your questions in the question panel box uh, over to the right and they'll be answered after the webinar session. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you to review on our website. So let's get started with our webinar, Sales Mastery. And I'd like to uh, introduce our guest presenter, Mr. David Rippey. He participates as a Chief Executive Board International Advisor. He is also the founder, president, and CEO of Trusted Advisors Guild and Celestial Inter International, which is a, a strategic marketing, communications, and creative services firm based in Cincinnati, Ohio. 
He specializes in the development of strategic marketing and communications campaigns, and he's worked for clients such as IBM, Wendy's, Microsoft, and Sony. Today, uh, I hope you'll learn how to develop a viable sales plan and manage a productive sales force uh, to grow your business quickly and efficiently. This webcast will cover a couple of different targets and, and a couple of different items such as uh, identifying your target audiences, evaluating your sales team, creating the right sales structure, determining your sales prospecting ratio, recognizing your two major obstacles to sales, and really how to hold your reps accountable. The uh, webinar is going to last approximately 45 minutes, and we'll take a few minutes at the end for questions. Uh, our contact details will be listed at the end of the presentation if you'd like to follow up with us. And at this point, uh, I'd like to turn the webinar over to our feature presenter, uh, Mr. David Rippey. David? Okay, thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate it. We could jump to the next slide. We have a little motivational quote here to start with, which is, uh, to reach a port, we must sail, sometimes with the wind, sometimes against it, but we must not dr drift or lie at anchor, and that's from Oliver Wendell Holmes. That's especially true in sales. You can't really uh, stick with the status quo, and that's especially true also with businesses overall. Um, so let's figure out how we can uh, sail onward uh, with the wind uh, from a sales perspective. So let's go to the next slide. And maybe you've experienced this, and Kevin mentioned the roller coaster ride a little earlier. Without a selling system, that is a, an entire process and a system, a methodology. Um, you can have a good month, and you have a down month, and you have another good month. And but a good viable system eliminates that that roller coaster ride of, of up and down sales, um, and uh, gets you on a steady path of growth. Not that every month is going to be. Um, you know, better than the last, but at least you want the, the chart to be going in an upward direction. So let's, let's move to the next slide. As you all know, uh, business ex is, is, blah, excuse me, businesses exist to make money. All businesses require cash and to generate revenue, goods, and services are exchanged for money. It's a very simple equation. Without sales, there is no company. So it's essential that a well-defined and, and managed selling system uh, is put in place to keep salespeople, the pipeline, and the business on track. Now, some of you may be thinking that uh, my industry and business are different, uh, and that's true. Every business is unique, and every industry has terminology, processes, and ways of doing things, but we all have to sell products or services or both to survive, and realistically, selling is selling regardless of the uniqueness of your offering. So the agenda for today is for sales mastery, and I should put out, point out that um, this webinar is a 45-minute webinar that is um, uh, skinny down from a three-day workshop, two and two to two and a half-day workshop that covers the course of three days. So uh, in in the process of um, skinnying this down, we realized that we could probably do a part one and a part two of this. So what you're getting today is part one, and we will schedule part two, uh, some, I think sometime in, the, in perhaps the June time frame. So the agenda today is to know your target audience, know your competition, sales offering, sales structure, the process, sales management, uh, major obstacles, and metrics and accountability. So with that, let's, uh, let's jump into the target audience. So I say this to every client, and it's remarkable. I, I've worked with hundreds of businesses around the world, uh, mostly in North America. Um, but most businesses think that they have a good handle on their target audience, and they do not. They don't, they don't think about it closely enough or clearly enough. And uh, this is the difference between hitting the target uh, um, on the right or missing the target, as you can see on the slide on the left. Uh, you can do all the efforts in the world, but if you're not going after the right target audience with the right materials and the right sales pitch, you're not going to succeed. So let's go to the uh, next slide. Uh, and as I said, one of the most important questions you must focus on and answer is, who is your target audience? 
who are they? And, and then once you know that, it's what are their pain points? What are, what are their hot buttons? Uh, what are their business issues and expected outcomes? And every industry and every business within that respective industry has a similar set of business issues and a similar set of expected outcomes. That if you can identify those business issues or have them identify them for you, and if you can address those business issues and give them the expected outcomes that they would like, you're going to win more business than not. However, most companies do not bother with this part of the sales cycle, and that's unfortunate. You also need to know with your target audiences, where do they get their information? Where do they get their news? Where do they follow trends? Who do they associate with? So all sales and marketing efforts must be centered on this information. Um, before you go to market at all, you really should have your marketing department or a marketing person uh, dive deep into um, that for you. So how do you identify your target audience? Uh, one exercise, and you know, you'll get these slides later, um, via the archive, uh, list your top three products and services. Determine the percentage of sales of those products and services. Then think about the target audience that uh, needs those products and services. Prioritize the importance of each of those. And then within those three products and services, now with this is each, list the five corresponding business issues associated with product or service number one. Do the same thing for product and service number two products and service number three, uh, and then list the five expected outcomes. Um, this information can then be used, and you'll find this to be a, a really great exercise, by the way. This information can be used for marketing pieces, your website, marketing campaigns, researching prospects, and, and, and also uh, for creating sales books. So you, and if you don't know what a sales book is, you basically identify an industry, say you want to go for the healthcare industry or uh, uh, any, any oil and gas industry, you put a sales book together, here's everything you need to know about this industry, these target audiences, and, and how we address it. Now, obviously, if you have more than three pro top products, then do it with five, but don't do it with you know 35. Do it with your top three to five. So when it comes to um, your competition, please don't assume that you know your competitors. Um, because chances are you really don't. Um, we, a lot of people make assumptions that, that oh, we got that down. We, we know exactly what our, who our competitors are and what they're about. Uh, but take some time to do an exercise to identify your 8 to 10 uh, competitors. Research their strengths and weaknesses. Review their websites. Look at the language they use. Compare and contrast what they do to your own efforts. And whenever possible, secure copies of their quotes and proposals. Not all of them, just, just a sampling so that you know what you're up against. So you take all those first bullets, and then what you want to do is you want to identify how are you different? What are your key differentiators? What's your USP? And USP stands for Unique Selling Proposition. Because what tends to happen when you, if you go and look at your top 10, top 8 to 10 competitors, and then you go and look at your, your website, you will find that you are most likely positioned exactly the same as your competition with no key differentiators. So what that boils down to is, why should someone buy from you versus someone else? Well, what you leave them with by accident is the is price. So it's important that you work on your key differentiators or your unique, unique sell, selling proposition. It's also important that you communicate your findings regularly to your sales team. It doesn't do any good as a, as a senior team uh, to keep that information uh, uh, locked up. You need to communicate that through the sales organization. And ensure that the sales team knows who they are competing against. So let's go on to the next slide, which is which gets into the meat of your sales team. So how would you rate your sales team? So this is just a take on uh, top grading. And top grading uh, can be used throughout any organization. I'm not an expert on it, but I know enough about it um, to know that it's effective. Um, and uh, you can rank your salespeople. A equals you would enthusiastically rehire them. B is a solid player, but they could improve. And C is they're mediocre, and you would not rehire them. And uh, so that's the that's the categorization. Um, a lot of times, companies spend all their time trying to increase the performance of their bottom 20% rather ensure, than ensuring that their best reps, the top 20%, are happy, paid well, and want to stay with the company. What you really want to do 
is uh, focus your energies on the A's and the B's, not on the C's. The C's you give a little bit of time, uh, training, and tools to, but you put them on plan, and if they don't hit their objectives within 60 to 90 days, uh, and you don't believe that C's can be moved up to a B, you have to let them go, or it's recommended to let them go. That's the sort of the cold part of managing your sales force. Let's go on to the next slide. So what you want to do is you want to take a look at your A, your B, and your C sales reps, and you evaluate each one individually. Now you can do this as a, as a management team, as a senior management team. You each do it separately, and then you can come together as a group and you say, okay, what do you think of Jerry? What do you think of Mary? What do you think of Bill and Bob and, and uh, Joanne? And, um, and then you just have a frank discussion about each of your sales reps. Obviously, this is highly confidential. It never comes out of the C-suite. Um, you, because people will be decimated if they uh, learn what your true evaluation of them is. So you take a look at them, you discuss who are your top reps, what you do want to do to protect your top reps, what will you do to keep them happy. Um, who are your B reps? Are they in the right role? What tools and training do they need? What soft skills do you need to teach them? Maybe it's time management, maybe it's territory management, maybe it's organizational skills. Uh, maybe it's how to close or how to prospect. Um, but what soft skills are you going to teach them? And then who are your C reps? And then in that case, you do the, the same thing. Are they in the right role? And if they're not, maybe there's a better place in the company. Maybe you have a, a person have a person in a hunter role that really would be a better account manager. Or maybe you have a person who's in an account manager role who would be better in inside sales or customer service. You determine... Uh, rather analytically, if they can be grown. Can you grow them into who you want them to be so that they're productive for the company? And then you have to determine how long you're going to give them to perform. Um, I, I know this sounds cold and calculating, but it's your business, it's your profit, it's your success online, and you really can't afford to have C reps hanging around for very long. And I think all companies, every company that I've ever been in or worked with, uh, has C reps. And the rest of the sales force is just waiting for the management to make a decision. And a funny thing happens. It's not so funny, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon. Once you take out one of the C players, by taking them out one, one, once you work with them and then you determine they're not going to make it and you, you uh, let them exit the company, once you do that, the morale and the energy and the direction and the focus of the rest of the sales force gains great momentum because people see that you're serious about it. Let's move on to the next slide, which is about sales structure. And what, what we advocate is to succeed, you, you must have a dedicated person in charge of sales. And that person really can't be the CEO or the president. I mean, it can be if, if you know, you're a small three or four person operation. But you really don't want the CEO or the president um, running the sales department um, because what happens is the CEO and the president have, you have a lot of other responsibilities, a lot of other duties, and um, you, get, you give it really just sort of a half measure. So what you really want is a dedicated sales leader, sales manager, VP of sales, director of sales, whatever that title is for your size of organization. And the benefits are you get close, closer oversight and sales rep accountability. You eliminate decision-making delays and bottlenecks. And I, I've worked with a lot of companies where the CEO was in charge of sales, and just nothing could get done because everybody is always waiting for him to get back to them, and it just doesn't work. You get you, the benef you, another benefit is you get the ability to handle issues as they happen. Um, you get daily and weekly review of key metrics that are essential for your success. You get pipeline accuracy. Uh, you, you have the ability to uh, coach and mentor. The sales leader has the ability to do pre-sales prep and post-sales call review, which is essential to the growth and development of salespeople. Um, the ability to do ride-alongs where the sales manager is, is you know, going on sales calls. And uh, obviously, a good sales leader has the ability to power close on important deals, deals of a certain size or, or, or a specific importance to the company. It just allows for a, more, a much more detailed sales process, better proposals, increased professionalism, and, and it gives sales the prominence and attention it deserves within the organization. Let's move on to the next slide here. So what, what, what would that look like? 
Well, a sales leader or sales manager should have no more than 8 to 12 direct reports. Any more than 8 to 12 becomes unmanageable, and sales will suffer from that. And if your sales force grows larger, then you're going to need uh, multiple sales managers based on you know, whether it's national, regional, or uh, local geography. You, know, you can break it up based on major accounts, vertical markets, inside sales, and even new, new initiatives. Um, the, it's just important um, that you get people on board um, and, uh, that can be managed to. So you, know, you want your sales leader to not be overwhelmed with 30 direct reports. You need to carve that up into 8 to 12 so they can be effective. Let's move on to the next slide. In this slide, you've probably all heard of the 80-20 rule. That's actually also called the Pareto Principle, and uh, or the law of the vital flu, a few, not the flu, uh, the law of the vital few. And that basically says the top 20% of your clients represent about 80% of your revenue. Now, it could be 25% of your clients represent 70% of your revenue, but it's, it's around in that range. And many companies spend far too much energy, time and energy, trying to grow the bottom piece of it, as though there's, there's gold sitting there. But the reality is that there's a lot more low-hanging fruit inside the top 20% of your clients that's not, that you're not getting to um, that you could easily pick up if you just focused on your top 20 clients, top 20% of your clients. Um, by focusing on the bottom, though, it drains valuable resource, it wastes critical sales time, and it takes attention away from growing your customers and your best opportunities. So let's uh, let's go on to uh, the truth about salespeople. So it's important to always assume that uh, positive intent about the people that you work with, that they are good at their core, that they want what's best for the company, they want what's best for uh, you, they want be what's best for um, themselves. Um, so until they prove otherwise, um, just assume positive intent. They want to succeed. They might not know how to succeed, but they definitely want to succeed. They don't come to work with the intent of failing, and most are doing their best. So why is it that salespeople miss their goals? Well, one reason that salespeople miss their goals, well, there's lots of reasons, but one primary reason is uh, they miss their goals because they don't have clear expectations. And one of the things you can do with, w w in that area is you can have success descriptions uh, of their job. So define sales goals, performance benchmarks, key competencies, and then you hold them accountable. They want to know what they need to do. So you have regular oversight. You have weekly sales reviews. You have quarterly plans. And you have annual uh, performance evaluations. Let's go on to the next slide. So here are some reasons why salespeople miss corticals. Number one is the corticals are wrong, uh, or the quotas are arrived at using the wrong methods. Uh, the salesperson doesn't know how to approach a changing market. Uh, they might be, uh, might be accustomed to selling products, and you might be in the services business. Uh, and it's a very difficult thing to make the transition from product sales to professional um, services sales. Uh, they don't know how to sell in a new buyer's buying market, and it is a buyer's market these days. Or they don't have the skill set or knowledge to execute your strategy. Or maybe they don't even know what your strategy is. They need to have more structure to consistently prospect, which is, which is a big problem. Or they've settled into a comfort zone. Um, um, people miss sales quotas because there are no consequences for the lack of performance or activity. Could be that your culture shows mediocrity, or not shows, allows mediocrity. Um, which is they've you know they they tread water and they they get to eighty percent of their quota every month or somewhere in that range or fifty percent but nobody nobody holds them accountable so um, you, you they settle for it. it's okay nobody's nobody's calling me out so that's what I'm going to do um, and then lastly uh, the big reason why salespeople miss quota goals is they're not suited for sales so let's move on. And, and by the way, you need to ask yourself about that uh, when you do your ABC analysis. Are they really suited for this job? So there's there are several proven selling strategies um, that are excellent out there, and uh, these are all uh, 
books and or strategies that you can get uh, or, or uh, software services that you can buy. The, the one that I like the best is customer-centric selling. It's a book. You can get it off of Amazon or you can get it through uh, CEBI. Um, uh, so it's called customer-centric selling, spin selling. Uh, and the next uh, uh, webinar that we do on Sales Master 2 will go a little deeper into each of these. Um, you can buy spin selling. You can do question-based selling, solution selling, the Sandler method, and obviously uh, also Miller-Hyman. Now, what I want to say about um, all of these is they're not the end-all to be-all. What they are is um, a good methodology, and most of these things are written for uh, large sales organizations. And what you want to do is you want to adapt to your real-world environment, the environment that you're working in, that they're living in. And um, so don't just don't try to like do everything that they say on each page. You got You have to adapt these things for what your organization can realistically achieve. But I do recommend that you you, you research um, these six and uh, and then come to a conclusion about which one's best for your organization. And if you need help with that, feel free to call me. My uh, statistics uh, are at the back to the end of this uh, presentation. You can feel free to email me or call me whenever you like. Let's go on to the next slide. So what are the basics of prospecting? So people are meeting goals, uh, aren't, are not meeting goals, then um, they're probably not um, doing what they need to do at the front end, which is the you know prospecting. So sales is a numbers game. X number of calls equals Y number of appointments. So that gets you Z number of proposals, which equals new customers. So um, the, the, there's, and there's a ratio that, that is involved there, uh, which we'll talk about on the next slide. However, the quality of the suspects the quality of the of the people that you're going after is much more important than the quantity. I once worked with a company in Manhattan who had a guy do nothing all day long but make phone calls. He'd make a couple hundred phone calls a day, and he never got any appointments. And it's because he was calling the wrong lists, and and it was because he was uh, unsuited for the role. But um, it's important that you have quality. Um, list to start with that, that are within your sweet spot and have been identified as part of your target audience. Let's go, let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about sales prospecting ratios. So generally what you can what what the, the ratio is is that it's a hundred to one ratio. So you have a hundred uh, leads and those aren't leads in the sense of they've indicated an interest. It's just basically a hundred contact names. Um, it takes about a hundred contact names to get down to one actual deal. So, but again, that changes based on whether they're cold leads, warm leads, or referrals. So, in business, and I don't have this in, in this particular session for today, but you know, you're much better off with warm leads and referrals than you are with cold leads. So, if, anytime you have uh, great um, customer relationships. If you can get them to make a warm referral, and a warm referral is all oh, is not, yeah, call David over at Celestia. A warm referral is they send an email or they make a phone call on your behalf and say, you know, you really ought to talk to David over at Celestia. And then, um, and then when you do contact them, they're waiting for your call and they're more than happy to hear what you have to say because if somebody that they know and trust. Uh, uh, recommends you, then they're going to uh, uh, trust you as well, uh, as long as you earn it. Let's go to the next slide. So coming up are probably uh, three of the most important slides of this whole uh, short webinar. So uh, here we go. There are two major obstacles to sales. The number one obstacle is fear of failure in the mind of the customer. Now that might sound counterintuitive, but it's absolutely true. They're afraid of making mistakes by their decision. They're afraid of, that they might pay too much. They, they're afraid of buying the wrong product. They're concerned about criticism from superiors. Uh, they're concerned that the product won't do as promised, and they're concerned that the service won't be there. So this is the this is the first emotion of the buyer. Uh, most people that are making that decision are averse to failure. They do not want to be perceived as failing. 
and so they're going to make this decision, and you you have to make it safe for them to do that. And a lot of organizations don't do that; they just go in uh, guns uh, guns a blazing and 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 um, you know skip several parts of the sales process to, 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 that actually can help make the customer or the prospect feel comfortable. So you need to work on that. Make sure that you understand the psychology of the person you're working with, which is fear of failure. Let's go to the second major obstacle. The second major obstacle is fear of rejection on part of your salespeople. So there is a tangible fear of no. Salespeople don't want to be rejected. No one wants to be rejected. So it, they make excuses for uh, why they don't get to uh, what they don't get to their prospecting, their phone calls, or their cold calling, or what, or their um, prospecting out in the field, or whatever. So the statistics are that 80% of sales calls end in no. So if you have a fear of no, and you're getting told four out of five times no, then you can see how it can be daunting for a salesperson to want to pick up that phone. But you need to give salespeople time. You need to give them time to develop their confidence. You need to give them time to develop their competence, to develop their product knowledge, and you need to help them uh, get resilience to handling rejection. And the only thing that can allow for that is to give them the time that they need so that they uh, then can realize that the world is not going to end when they're told no for the 80th time, that it's just, OK, time to pick up another call, pick up the phone. and make another make another phone call. Let's go on to the next slide. So here and these are these are sales statistics that came out of uh, Columbia University. So here is something that uh, I think everyone on this call ought to take to heart. This is how your salesperson's typical day goes. Maybe not your hunters, maybe not your A players, but this is this is the majority of how your 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 uh, salespeople are using their day. The average salesperson sells one and a half hours per day. The first sales call doesn't happen until 11 a.m. I got to get coffee. I got to make some copies. I have to talk to uh, uh, Mary in accounting. You know, there's all kinds of excuses that people make, but they don't start making their calls until 11 a.m. 80% uh, of all sales happen after the fifth attempt to reach the customer. But only 10% of salespeople make those five phone calls, which is why your A players are good at what they do and the rest are not, because they are persistent, they're diligent, and they go after it. 50% of your salespeople will make only one call. And as I said earlier, salespeople procrastinate to avoid rejection. So those last three slides really should be eye-openers for you and your sales team, um, because it really spells out you know, the, the fear of the customer, the fear of rejection, and where your sales rep is putting their hours. So now that you have this information, you can kind of look at it a little differently, and you can gauge where are they putting their time. Let's go on to the next slide. So to get a prospect's attention, whether on the phone, in person, or in email, you, you have to plan your approach. The approach must be thought through and well rehearsed. You, you, you have to break through the preoccupation of the prospect. So every word of the approach needs to be planned. And there's a psychological study that shows that if you want to be really good at something, you practice it in front of a mirror 17 times. You say it out loud 17 times, start to get into your system, and then and then you become very good at it because then you you acclimate and you and you start to make the words and the and the inflection and the way you deliver it is your own. So each word of the approach must be planned. You need, as I said earlier, you have to break the preoccupation of the of the prospect. You're calling them up and they're busy in the middle of something else, and you have to get them their attention right away. You only have 30 seconds to get their full attention. So the opening question is critical. I used to work with a guy who's opening line was, and I, I'm not recommending that you do this, uh, his opening line was, I am not an egg. And it caused people to break their preoccupation and say, what? Again, I'm not recommending that. That was just something that this person did. Um, so the opening question is critical. You must address the key need of the prospect 
the approach question must address the unspoken thought, which is, why should I listen to you? And that you, you want to get the prospect to ask, what is it, in a nice way. Um, and you need to make it specific and quantifiable, not general. So let's, let's jump to the next slide. So the prospect wants to be sure of five things before they're going to give you the time of day. That you have something important to communicate, uh, that they are the right person, that you're not going to waste their time because you're trying to uh, talk to them about something that they're not even qualified to answer on, that your visit is going to be short, that there's no obligation, and that you were not, will not use high-pressure sales tactics. Let's jump to the next one. So you start with you start the prospecting call with a courtesy question that they can't say no they cannot say no to, which is may I ask you a question? And then you lead with uh, into the question that breaks their preoccupation. Would you like to hear a proven method whereby you can increase sales by twenty to thirty percent per year? Now, obviously that is just an example. It has to be tweaked toward your business and your services and or products that you're offering. I just need 10 minutes of your time, and you can judge for yourself. Would tomorrow afternoon or next morning work for you? If the customer says, call me next week to set a time, don't accept that. You respond with, I have my day planner, or I have my Outlook calendar up right here. Is yours handy? Why don't we just schedule it right now? And then you repeat the date and time to which you just agreed. Make sure your salespeople are polite, firm, friendly, and be sure to smile. Now, you want to be sure to smile even though you're not in front of them because people can hear your, you know, whether you're um, fully vested or not. It's an uncanny thing, but you know, make sure that you're friendly and that you're smiling uh, or yourself people are. Do not sell or describe your product on the phone. Just don't do it. Just make sure you get a face-to-face -face appointment. Never mail or email information. If you're mailing it to somebody or emailing it, that is just a surefire way for you to get blown off. They'll throw it in the garbage can the minute it gets there, or they'll delete your email, and you'll never hear from them again. So even though somebody will say, can you mail me information or email me information, go for the direct face-to-face -face meeting. And always call and confirm the day before. Just make sure that you do that. That's an important to follow up. So in terms of um, oversight, how do you measure, track, and hold the salesperson accountable? Well, first of all, you have to inspect what you expect. If you're not going to ask them qualifying questions, if you're not going to have metrics in place, uh, you, you, you're, you're going to get a bad result. So let's jump to the next slide. So you define the performance met metrics. You start with sales quota. You calculate uh, sales the sales prospecting ratio. And uh, in, the, in the next webinar that we do on this topic, we will have uh, how to calculate your sales prospecting ratio in there. So you might, it's an eye opener because you might say, well, if we can just get in front of 20 people, well, okay, if you want to get in front of 20 people, how many people does that mean that you have to start prospecting to get to those 20 people? Could be, could be as many as uh, you know, 20,000. Uh, it depends on your business, and, and but there are ways to calculate that 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 uh, work specifically for your organization, so you you have the data right in front of you and, you and you know it works. So you determine also with the salesperson the right mix of activities for the salesperson or the sales team. So you need to make you need to make this many calls per week, you need to send this many emails, you need to send this many letters, you need to make this many cold calls, depending on your on your sales model. Um, you need to know the number of proposals needed. Uh, you need to set it up in an automated sales dashboard for daily review against your quota. And if you're not using a CRM system, uh, like uh, Salesforce or SalesNow, and there's a number of profit, um, sugar, there's a lot of good ones out there. If you're not using an automated uh, CRM sales tracking system, you, you really need to invest in that. Most of them are in the cloud these days, and you can, you know, you can uh, use the service for you know, $50 or so uh, per month. Uh, have weekly sales meetings or sales calls to keep the, your team on track, and then absolutely have quarterly one-on-ones with sales reps. As soon as you close your quarter and you know how they did, have quarterly one-on-ones with them so, so that they can never get uh, too far out of alignment with what your sales goals are. 
because uh, you know already we're here in uh, uh, mid March, and uh, so the year, if you're on a calendar year, it's about uh, it's going to be about 25% done at the end of March, and it takes a, it's hard to recover if you're if you're already off. Uh, let's say you know a person's got to do uh, you know, say do four million a year, and at the end of the first quarter they're at uh, half a million. They get, they have a gap of a half a million that they have to make up plus the million that they need in the next quarter. So what gets measured gets done, and that is what's going to determine your sales success is your ability to uh, inspect what you expect and measure uh, the, the success of your sales team on a on a daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis. Um, so that is uh, a very fast Reader's Digest view. There's a lot more detail to all this, which I'm more than happy to share with you um, uh, at your convenience if you want to email me or call me or work through uh, Kevin and CEBI. Um, and I do encourage you to uh, come to the next Sales Mastery Part 2 uh, webinar, which we'll go into some more detail in some other areas. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, David, we do have a couple of questions. The um, okay. first one's from Jessica, and her question is, what if we can't afford a sales manager? The question is, you know, you need to look at your sales volume, uh, and you need to determine what what's the opportunity cost that you're losing. So if, if and, and there's a way to do this, so maybe you have a sales manager who's also a sales person, and that person has a quota not only for uh, the overall company goals, but maybe that person has to work on major accounts and be involved in the sales process. So I would look at uh, the opportunity cost uh, and determine is it costing you more by having salespeople who don't know the direction they're going in and therefore aren't performing very well um, uh, versus what it would cost to have that person on board. Now, if your company is small, your firm is small enough that you really cannot truly afford it, then what I would do is have the um, the, the, uh, the VP or uh, a VP of marketing or the CEO take on that role, and I would really study the techniques that you need. Uh, you know, get customer centric selling. Uh, put all these other things in place, uh, work with an organization to help uh, ferret out what you really need to do and get some clear direction and hold people accountable. If you really truly can't afford it, then you have to assign it to somebody because you're not going to succeed any other way. Okay, and the next question we have is from Wynn. And his question is, my account managers don't go after new business. What can I do to get them to do more prospecting? Well, uh, the first thing you have to do that I would recommend is determine if the salesperson is a hunter or a farmer, whether they are going to go out and get new business, if they're wired for that, or if they are uh, more of an account manager. Because if they're in an account manager role, and let's say they have excuse me, a half a dozen major accounts or you know, a dozen major accounts, and they're, they're responsible for handling all the business, maybe it's two, three, four million dollars in business, they probably do not have the capacity to go out and find new business. They would be better off farming the business inside and picking up the low-hanging fruit inside the existing customer base rather than expecting them to all of a sudden become dynamic uh, hunters. Hunters want to do, hunters want to go out, find the new business, close it, drag the bear back to the cave, and then move on to the next thing. They don't really want to manage the account. They don't really want to cultivate the relationship after the, the big sale. And so that's a, that's a specific personality type that likes to go out and, and hunt the big game. They're also horrible uh, at detail and horrible at putting things into the CRM system. They're hard to con contain, but they're, they're rainmakers. So uh, the thing to do is to make sure that if you, if your account managers are too busy dealing with 
um, the existing business and, the, and their and their quota is high enough where they you know okay they're knocking down two three four million dollars a year in sales um, they might not actually have the capacity or they might not actually have um, the personality type to do it they're better at account management in which case what you really want to do is is not put the burden on them but go out and get a hunter and just say okay uh, David I see that you really don't uh, it's not uh, you know, I've asked you over and over and over again to prospect. To, you know, you haven't done that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring in somebody else who's going to handle that. You, these accounts are safe. They're grandfathered. You can continue to work them. Um, as the, as the, as new accounts are brought in by the hunter, uh, we'll determine which ones you might be able to then account manage later on after they get to a certain level of maturity. And then you have a compensation plan that allows for the hunter to go out and 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 get X amount for bagging the big game, and then you have, you know, after a year, maybe that account reverts to uh, a, an account manager who then gets a lesser commission uh, for the sales growth inside that existing account. Okay. And we did have a question about, uh, from Jeff, about getting a copy of these slides. On Friday, the uh, entire presentation will be emailed to the participants of the webinar, and it will also be available on our website as well. And David, we have one more question from Michael. And you touched on this a little bit during the presentation, but um, I'll let you see if you want to go into a little bit more detail. It says, we have a salesperson who regularly misses his quota. He always has good reasons for it, but he never seems to hit them. What do you recommend? Well, uh, yeah, I did touch on it a, a little earlier, which is you know, um, set an expectation. Here are the goals. Uh, put your put the energy on how many calls is the person making? Um, does he have the right tools? Does he have the right training? And you have to evaluate whether this person is suited for the role. Is you know obviously if he's not hitting quota or she's not hitting quota, then what you need to do is say okay, is this a C rep? If it's a C rep, can I grow them? And if I can't grow them, I have to I have to sadly and coldly I have to let them go. Um, if it's a D rep and they do okay, but you know they, they're having a hard time getting to the next level, then give them some enhanced tools, some some more training. Um, but if they're if they regularly are missing their quota, determine if their quota is correct. Determining determine if they're in the right role, and then go back and um, give them clear performance metrics about what you expect, and then measure that every week. I was just uh, speaking with somebody earlier today. A client earlier today, and uh, they have a salesperson who, uh, in the course of a year and a half, has only brought in, you know, just only tens of thousands of dollars in new business. And the person was supposed to bring in, you know, in that period of time, about a million. Well, you know, that person is now on plan, and I mean, meaning that they have, you know, 90 days to turn it around, and they're in the documentation phase, figuring out how to how to work that person out of the company. So if, if if you have a prospecting goal of a million dollars in new business over the course of a couple of years, and you're sitting at you know thirty thousand, uh, it's pretty clear that person's not going to get there. And if you ask questions like, well, how much is this account worth, and what have you done in this account, and you're getting blank stares or you're getting uh, answers like, uh, well, uh, then you know that that person really is not working the account. They're just giving you names, putting it in to the CRM, and they're trying to fool you into thinking that they're actually doing their job. So um, you, you just have to use some some uh, scrutiny and uh, some due dil and do some due diligence on whether or not they're really performing in their role. And if they're not, sadly you have to you have to take action. Okay. Thank you so much, David. And I believe at this point we're going to turn it back over to Kevin Minton. Okay. Thank you, Robin and uh, David. Um, well, um, this concludes the presentation. I want to make you aware uh, the webinar was hosted by Chief Executive Boards, and I want to invite you to uh, visit our website for additional insights and upcoming events such as the uh, web uh, cast that you see listed on this uh, slide here. So on May 13th, uh, we're actually going to go into something a little different called Lucrative Corporate Healthcare Options. Uh, that's a topic that uh, many of our board members and uh, a lot of people are facing today in companies. Um, we actually have a company called Claim Links that uh, is, is going to be presenting on this topic and, and offering up some alternatives to uh, 
the traditional uh, methods and means that you see that are available today. And then you heard David mention earlier that uh, we're going to address uh, the, the second part of this uh, webinar today, and uh, that will be June 24th. And uh, then in July, we'll have a webcast on emotional intelligence and leadership management. Um, so I want to uh, thank our presenter, David uh, Rippey, and uh, I hope you have found this to be helpful. I want to invite you to contact Chief Executive Boards uh, with any questions or David Rippey. Uh, I believe you saw his contact information on there as well. And, of course, I want to invite you to uh, please join us for future webinars. Uh, we look forward to uh, speaking with you regarding future engagements with uh, Chief Executive Boards and uh, Celestia. And I want to wish you all a great week ahead. Uh, thank you and farewell. And this concludes our webinar.